So some time ago, I was given a charter to increase the efficiency uh, or the opportunity of efficiency for our researchers. And one of the things that bubbled up out of that, uh, that charter was to give them... Like I said, we were inspired by Texas Advanced Computing uh, Center. They have some very impressive visualization tools down there and very great support for their faculty members as well. Uh, we can show you some pictures of that. We don't really have time to get into their system. But the inspiration we took from that is not to replicate what they do, but to advance beyond it in a manner that's suitable for the researchers on our, our campus. So we're working on this project that we call Vader. And the blue thing that you see up here is actually earthquake data that's rendered. Uh, this is 12 days of earthquake data in 1980. And we thought that this would be a, a useful tool to illustrate what kinds of uh, patterns can emerge from data sets. I'm not going to go into this here. You can see this running next door. We can talk about uh, the patterns that pop out. But we're really focused at targeting the human ability to pick out patterns in data phenomena. And so if you go next door and you see this, one of the things that you can pick out in the data set that's shown there is the Earth is built like an onion. Instead of the typical uh, core mantle model that we all learned in, uh, in elementary school. And that knowledge was something that we discovered independently the first time we fired this data set up in this tool. The corresponding, I found out that that knowledge had been the basis of a graduate student's project. And it took him considerably longer than the 12 seconds it took us to find that. The, yes, indeed, the earthquake data uh, shows patterns that show the earth is built like an onion. We also found some very interesting uh, earthquakes going on in Siberia in 1980. Uh, they were very short in duration, but they were pretty massive, and uh, we would like to know what that was about. Uh, we are uh, operating in the spirit of open cooperation, so uh, the kinds of tools we're building, uh, if you want to build one for your campus, uh, or you want to use, if you're from s and and you want to use our campus's facility to learn more about it, uh, we're, we're all ears. We're happy to tell you about it and tell you how to do it. So, who's actually doing the work? I just point my finger. My role at the university, I'm so, uh, so obsolete that all I can do is say, go fix this, or go build me one of these that looks like this. And uh, the people that actually do the work are these guys. Uh, there's four names up here, so one of our guys isn't uh, attending. He's probably in class or something. Uh, but they're, they're going to talk to you about the system itself. And the team leader for this year on this project, this multi-year project, is David Zeman. And I think, David, you're up next. So we started this here in Rolla at Missouri University of Science and Technology, and we began in January with just a concept. All we knew is that we wanted to make it easier for researchers to view their data. We knew we wanted to give them a wireless remote, of some, some way to interact with the data. It didn't have to be a remote. Um, we wanted to immerse them in their data, we wanted to make it 3D, and we wanted to let them see large data, big data. Um, and so we started doing some research, and we found a lot of it was kind of done in parts, and uh, so then we really began digging into figuring out what hadn't been done and integrating it all together. We ran across a couple speed bumps. Uh, so a really big part is that all the researchers have not created their data in a way that is made to go into a visualization platform like Paraview, which is what we're running. Their data is in CSV format, or binary format, or this other CSV format. And Parity doesn't want to read that. <laughs> so my other part of the project is not just being project lead, it's creating a universal <coughs> translator, or transformer as we're calling it, that takes whatever their data looks like and makes it in a readable format for Parity. And does it efficiently, so that if you, uh, you convert your data, you put it up on our screen, and you say, oh wait, Let's try mapping the axes another way. You can reconvert the data in a timely fashion without having to go home and take a lunch break. Uh, we've also built a mobile cluster so that we can take it to you, um, or we can move it to this demo room, to our office, wherever we're going to be. Eventually, we will hook it up to our HPC, um, and it's, I think, for the main production. Uh, but for now, we can take it wherever we want with the screen. Um, like I said, we're trying to phase out the mouse and keyboard. Uh, so that you're not tied down to you know, a, a 
desk or something when you're standing in front of a big mobile immersive screen. Um, so we tried a connect that didn't work. I'll go into that later. But we ended up with the Wiimote and it works beautifully. Uh, it's actually easier than the mouse and more precise than the mouse. Uh, and we've definitely run into challenges by uh, uh, completing goals on time. We have lives too and homework and <laughs> classes and other things. <laughs> so it's been fun but we've been managing it pretty well so far. We're also all students, and we're not graduate students, we're undergrads. So we're taking full class loads, um, and because we are employees that are then graduating and leaving in a very short time frame, uh, Mark likes to hire young students so that he doesn't have to retrain them every year. But that means he's hiring inexperienced students. That was me <laughs> nine months ago. Uh, I knew a little bit about Linux, I kind of knew the basics of Bash terminal and now I'm pretty darn good with it. Um, I've learned an entire language while I was here, but uh, it's difficult to use students um, to do a big project like this and to keep uh, teaching the new students coming in and make sure knowledge transfers from the old students leaving. Um, and it's difficult to, to make sure everyone's around in the office at one time instead of one guy comes in in the morning and then another guy comes in, but the first guy goes to class, and then the second guy, it's horrible. <laughs> and then we try not to do too much paperwork for HR, hiring and firing and hiring and leaving and other stuff. <laughs> so how exactly does data transformer work? Uh, many little steps. I've been trying to get multiprocessing work, which would make this much more complicated, but for now it's just a single thread. Um, and we start by figuring out where are the files. Um, once we locate the files, I need to ask, how is it formatted? So a professor can write a very uh, short file, single line, that describes what the data looks like. Um, and then we, I, I look through all of the files, because it can translate multiple files in a single run of the program. And if I see that two files both have X as a field name, I need to learn what to do with that. For instance, uh, Dr. Gao's earthquake data has two files that are not redundant. They need to be appended to each other. They both contain the same type of data, but they're independent data. They need to be added together. Then I've got Dr. Dawes's uh, chemistry data, which contains some redundant and some non-redundant fields. <laughs> I'm getting into too much detail. So <laughs> uh, then we look at what the dates are um, and if it needs to format the timestamps. Uh, and you can rename <coughs> fields, delete fields, create new fields such as calculated fields. So I can calculate a uh, field from one file, subtract it from a field from another file, or multiply it, or multiply by time to get, create a function in this. Um, and then we convert the timestamps, uh, after we, sorry, read the data in, convert the timestamps. Uh, do any calculations like I mentioned, uh, and then we have to split this data set into multiple time fields. Uh, and then I finally, when all that's done, write it to the binary file and then write the XDMF description file, which is an XML language. So I run into a number of challenges while doing this. Uh, for one, I tried to do this in C++ and it didn't work at all. I thought it would be great because it was low level, I could optimize it, and I got uh, one sample of the program running in two seconds. I was like, okay, that's really fast. And I thought I would try it in Python, but I didn't have very, many, very high hopes. So I learned Python. I didn't know it at first. And then I spent about a half hour uh, with my dad who helped me optimize the Python. And I didn't have very high hopes, and I ran it 0.8 seconds. That was a little better. <laughs> so I've been using Python ever since. Um, like I said, I tried to go with multi-threading, but it didn't work out uh, because I had to communicate from each thread to read the information, send it to another thread, calculate the information, send it to another thread, write the information, and it created too much overhead and all this multi-threading, and it slowed it down a lot more than it helped. So I went back to single thread. Um, I will eventually go to multi-threading once I learn how to do it a little bit better. Timestamps was a huge problem because every timestamp looks different. And right now the longest 
time, uh, the, the longest portion of my uh, run time is in calculating the timestamps. Uh, and the read-write configuration has been quite difficult because every, I mean, that's the whole point of this is that I can read any data set. But that's a big challenge right there is writing one program that can read any language and then figure out what the XDMF language is supposed to look like. So I didn't know that at first. <laughs> So I'd like to hand it over to Nathan, who's our system administrator, and we'll talk to you about how it's all set up. All right, so with a we're rendering large data like this, we've got you know, a whole lot of hardware behind it, especially if we're going to scale up to terabyte scale. So we have a uh, head node, which is, I guess, I no. oh, Yes, I do. All right, we got a head node that, you know, display, that runs pair view and reads your files and displays and things out to these projectors. And each projector is running at 1280 by 720, and they're actually doing 3D sync, or I guess they're doing 3D projection, so you can wear 3D glasses, which means that it's 120 hertz um, signal, which is quite a lot of data to be rendering at one time. So in order to allow for that, we have, or will have soon, a bunch of render nodes. So Parity will be like, I need, I have this, you, you receive this input to render this part of the screen sends it out to the render nodes, they all render it separately and send it back to pair view and it displays it to the screen. And then as well we have the Wii, which is connected via Bluetooth, um, and that is using what we use for navigating the data. Um, so the software stack here it has pair view running in the center, and then that receives data from the XDMF transformer of David's project, so that's the data that we receive in. And then we receive in stuff from the inter interaction software, so the controls from the Wii, and then Paraview receives the uh, interaction controls, looks at what that means as far as the picture that needs to be sent, sent to the screens, and then asks the render nodes to render all that. So they actually run on separate um, X -win or well on GPUs. They actually render the thing on the GPU and then send it back over the network. And in order to support the bandwidth required for the network, both for sending data to render to the nodes and then also receiving the rendered data back, we figure out that we pretty much need infinite band. Um, otherwise, it just gets way too laggy. So as far as challenges for building a cluster, one of the things we ran into was triple head video output. Uh, we were going to have three screens over there. Um, and unfortunately, pretty much up until right about now, there hasn't been a whole lot of need for a single graphics card that can do three 3D video signals at one point in time. Um, we had a couple of different options that we looked at doing multiple screens, but none of them we could get 3D acceleration on. So the rendering would have just been incredibly slow and choppy. Um, and then as well, InfiniBand drivers are kind of special. Um, they're mostly targeted towards like CentOS and some of the other operating systems that are typically run on clusters, but those also don't run cutting edge Linux kernels and things like that. We run Ubuntu 1204, which is not exactly cutting edge, but it's still running the Linux kernel version 3.2, which they don't have InfiniBand drivers for yet. So that is a project that I'll be working on in the next couple of weeks here. Um, setting up Paraview to render on a bunch of CUDA cards. These cards don't have screens attached to them. So usually graphics dis display drivers are like, well, there's no screen attached, so there's no real point in me doing very much. I'll just pretend like I'm doing some things and then not, real, not really you know, let you take advantage of the full power that it has. So we had to do a bit of work to trick them into running at full power even without a screen attached. And, uh, and as well, we, for, especially if you're scaling up to terabyte size data, we're going to need high bandwidth hard drives to be able to read the data off quickly. And then as well, InfiniBand networking for handing around the rendered data inside the network, um, especially between the uh, head render server that you know, involves pretty much receiving all the traffic from every node, so it gets exponentially larger. And as well, we designed this cluster for mobility so we could bring it you know, to researchers and you know, show it off in classrooms and demos and things like this. And so this limits the amount of nodes we can bring, both because we just can't carry like you know, giant you know, full-size racks into various demo rooms and you know, there's only so much power you have there. We didn't want to attempt um, remote rendering situation or remote rendering setup yet because we're concerned about network lag. You know, you have to, when you render something remotely, the command has to go 
over the network to the render servers and then receive data back. And that, you know, the longer that takes, the slower the program feels to the user. And that makes it feel much less guess, immersive. So those are some of the challenges we face setting up the cluster. And now I'm handing this over to Travis, who set up the user interaction stuff. All right. So the first problem we really ran into when we started designing the system was that the users was still tethered to the keyboard and mouse to try to manipulate the data when you're trying to stand in front of a screen in 3D. You don't want to have a desk in front of you. So our goal was to liberate them from it, and our solution, current solution is using the Wii mode. How the Wii architecture works is that Paraview has a, so or a socket plugin built into it that allows you to connect from any external device and be able to Python connect it. So what our Wii mode does is that when it initially runs, it sends an init file that has preloaded Python commands that we use. And so when you um, use the nunchuck and start take our moving the joystick, it changes um, the polar to um, mouse coordinates, um, XY coordinates, and can change the data that way. Um, it's a really neat system to use because the socket allows you to use almost any application that's open source, like an Android phone or stuff. So um, while we're using the Wii, there is development to go and use other things like an Android app or something. Uh, we have run into some challenges with the system, though. Um, all the Python code is based on uh, Paraview's own code, how it renders with the um, mouse. So, but the source code is so complex, it's hard to translate all that into Python code. So we originally, um, some of the issues we ran into first was just trying to figure out how to do it. Um, like David said earlier, our first way of doing it was going to use the connect with hand gestures. Um, he was actually working on that when I joined, and that got handed off to me. And um, um, we ran into the same problem with the IR for the Wii uh, mode, is that when you try to read the data in, there's no software stacks that um, smooth it out. You have to write algorithms. And so our uh, problem was that you would try to render it, and you're doing this, and the computer's seeing this. So then all of a sudden, your data's everywhere. Um, so that's where a lot of noise comes from. Um, Linux itself also lacks a lot of um, high-level gesture support. Um, there's not as many um, open source um, documents out there for us to use. Um, the current problem we're really running into with the Wii mode is um, the synchronization with Paraview. The Wii mode pulls at 100 hertz, while Paraview takes data at 30 hertz. It ren renders at 30 hertz. So um, our first step, as you, if you've seen the, um, the demo, you might have noticed that it's a bit laggy. Um, we're working on creating a timer to smooth that out so it backs up and waits for Paraview to be ready. Um, it's really interesting to um, work through this as a student with no experience, and not, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm afraid we're going to run short of time. Some people like to run. We've gone through some trial and error. This is actually a research project that we're trying to bury under the carpet of funding, uh, <laughs> over funding. So anyway, uh, so we've done a number of, of uh, false starts and, and learned some things. Uh, but where we're going is to enable the researcher to say, that's a data anomaly I want to study. And so we want that researcher to be able to put that data out and then study it with some other tool. Uh, we want the, the system to be able to uh, transform itself dynamically to the needs of the researcher. Uh, we don't want to limit them to our view of what a data set is. We want <coughs> the system to adapt to their view of what a data set is. So financial data, medical data, uh, earthquake data, which seems to be our current favorite, uh, <laughs> chemistry data, whatever it is. We don't, we're tool builders, we're not the tool users. And um, we are doing a continuous set of studies on how to make 3D immersive environment more real. Uh, this, this latest attempt that we've got next door is, uh, is fused with specialized coatings and glass planes and some other things. Um, it, and we're learning things, we're seeing different effects. But at the end of the day, it's the effectiveness for the user that that's all we're concerned about. 
So, what's Vader? What's Vader going to be? What is it today? Uh, we're on this road to build the simplest possible, most powerful possible rendering system to throw you into a 3D data environment, your data, and let you swim around it without being a comp sci techie. You know what that to me. Now, they think I won't get it. Uh, which <laughs> is probably true to some degree. Uh, my response would be just figure it out. <laughs> but at the end of the day, this system is an analytical tool. It's, it's like a hammer, you know? And data is our nail. And we want to be able to drive that nail into the ground and make our researchers much more productive carpenters because they can drive the nail. Now, on the campus, uh, Vader is available for testing with your data sets. If you send your data sets to us, we'll visualize them. We'll run them through David's transformation tool. I can't ever remember what it's called. And uh, it will be something you can come and look at. By the end of uh, May 2013, the system will be available for you to use just independently of us. So, so that's where we're at, and that's where we're going. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions from anybody? Okay, so either they didn't get it or worse something. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for coming. And the next session starts in four minutes.